Father, we thank you that we've given a privilege this morning to worship such an awesome and majestic God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to hear from you, speak to our hearts. So, Lord, I pray that you would do just that, that you would convict us and exhort us and comfort us and encourage us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's listening people said, Amen. Amen. Again, if you have a Bible, would you mind opening God's Word with me in Romans chapter 3? Romans chapter 3. We continue our journey through this amazing letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And as you're opening there, I was uh, just thinking about the importance of having right diagnosis. Right diagnosis. And uh, I grew up in, uh, in Romania in a, with the medical system at, at that time. Um, was not as, um, as advanced as the one here. So you'd always wanted to hear another opinion or the third opinion or fourth opinion. And uh, you wanted to make sure that you have the right diagnosis. Why? Because if you don't have the right diagnosis for the problem, you cannot have the right cure. You cannot have the right cure. And again, that happens even here. You can have the greatest advancements in the world of technology, but we're still fallen people. And um, you might have mishaps on that, but it's less plausible uh, when you are doing due diligence. Why? Because again, you want to know what you're dealing with. And you rather have someone who is honest and sincere, even though a doctor may not have the good uh, manners to know how to tell you, rather hear the truth because you know how to deal with the solution there. You, you don't want someone who's uh, smoothing you around and trying to speak nicely but doesn't tell you what actually is the problem. In Romans chapter 1 to 3, now remember when Paul wrote this letter, he didn't write it in chapters and in verses. He wasn't thinking that someone will just pick it apart and, and not read it in one setting. But as he wrote this letter to the Romans, he started by sharing with them the bad news. Sharing with them a diagnosis that he sees uh, about them and, and the church and reminding them what the x-rays shows. He is a spiritual doctor who walks them through what is their problem so that they can understand the solution. Because if you don't understand the root problem, what you're going to do is just put band-aids on what you think is the problem. And the solution would be just temporarily. So in the chapter 1 to 2, especially the second part of chapter 1, we are told what the root of the problems of the world around us is the root is the fact that people have rejected the knowledge of God you are dismayed and discouraged by all the immorality that you see around you and, and we see not just here but all throughout the world you don't like what you see in terms of all the distortions of human sexuality of of uh, human dignity and human value that's because the problem is sin and in chapter 2, he's actually kind of changing gears towards the people who grew up in the environment of religion. He's primarily tackling the Jewish believers who grew up in conservative circles and who are tempted to say, I cannot believe they do those things out there. I cannot believe that they, they are so wicked. And, and Paul wants to point out to them, you are as wicked as well. It's just that you don't show it externally. But internally, you are also guilty of the same sins. And he's trying to tell them that even though they have all these blessings, they, and they have all these privileges with God, at the end of the day, what truly makes you a Jew, and you heard Pastor Sam speak about this, chapter 2, what truly makes you a Jew is not all this external stuff, but an internal circumcision of the heart. A true Jew. And you can listen to that message online, in which, again, the emphasis is that what makes you a true believer, a true son of God, is a changed heart. A heart that honors the Lord. A heart that is wanting to follow Jesus or God. In chapter 3, Paul is actually anticipating some objections. It's very interesting. This guy is a lawyer by trade. He is versed into God's law. He knows 
his audience and he knows that this guy is most likely will come up with some kind of a rebuttals or questions. So as a good lawyer, as a good teacher, he's anticipating some of the objections. So there's like three or four objections depending on how you see them in the first part of chapter 3. And then he's giving some arguments for some of the points he's making. So with that in mind, I want us to read Romans chapter 3, verse one to 20, verses 1 to 20. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God or the word of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one of one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my life God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already changed, charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So, <clears throat> in the first eight verses here, he's presenting, as I said, several objections. And depending on how you want to analyze them, they're either three or four. I think they're, they're three with two uh, kind of scenarios uh, in verses five, or excuse me, verses seven to, to nine. But I want us to take a, tackle each one of them. And it might not be as maybe relevant to you today, even though I think they are, but they're very relevant for the Jewish audience that Paul writes to. So we're going to go pretty quickly through them, but nevertheless, I think there are implications for us today. First objection to this idea that true Jews are only the ones who are changed in heart. Because in their minds, they're like, okay, so what is the difference then? If, I'm, if we're all messed up, we're all sin, under sin, is there any advantage to the Jew? That's their first objection. What is the advantage of the Jew? Is there any advantage of the fact that someone are ethnically Jew or not? And he says, yes. He responds with the answer, there is value in the fact that God has entrusted the revelation of God, God's word to them. And the promises came through them. So he says, it doesn't make you necessarily better in God's eyes, but you have an advantage in the, in the sense that you are so close to what God has revealed. You know what's required of you. That's why, for example, when Paul or Jesus would go in a town, the first place they would go to was where? In a synagogue. Because these guys already had the background. They knew who the Messiah was. They knew about an idea that they were expecting a Messiah. They, they, they know about the concept. They might not have believed that Jesus is the Messiah, but some of them did. They didn't have to do all the work of background, as you would have to do with someone who's never been trained at all in the Bible. If Paul had to write to us today, he would probably say something like, is there any benefit for someone to be exposed to God's Word, even though they're not believers? But is there any benefit to come regularly to church, even though you haven't given your life to Christ? Let's put it more practical. Is there any benefit to train your kids in the Lord, even though you know that unless God does the work of changing their hearts at one point, they're not going to truly, fully obey? 
So why bother teaching them to obey if you know that only God can do that? Because God can use that and will use that to bring the gospel to them. You see, it's so much easier for someone who's been trained in the things of God, first of all, to stay away from a lot of bad things out there, and second, to understand the message of the gospel. That's why there is an emphasis on the importance of preaching God's word and the importance of giving God's word to everyone around us. Because even if you're not a Christian and you follow the principles of God's word, your society will be better. Your life will be better off. There's a book out there that actually one of the brothers who is a member of this church, his name is Vishal Mangalwadi. Vishal wrote a book that became a, a bestseller. It's still uh, used in a lot of universities called The Book That Made Your World. And it's endorsed by a lot of people, Oz Guinness, Dallas Willard, Chuck Colson, all that. Anyhow, but Vishal in that book, he makes a point that our Western society or entire world has been totally transformed because of the Bible. And the societies who are doing better, like countries in the Western world, like America or England or Germany, are way more advanced because of the Bible. It doesn't mean that we are a Christian nation, that everyone is Christian in the sense that we're all under the same banner. No, but you have access to God's word. You have access to God's guidelines. And even though you're not a Christian and you abide by that, you're going to see a lot of results. But ultimately, of course, we know that God has to change someone's heart for that to matter in his eyes. So is there important or is there a benefit in having God's word on a regular basis in your home, in your church, being exposed to it? Yes, in your culture, in your schools, in your society. Yes, yes, yes. Second objection, does Jewish unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Verses three and four. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify their faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one of were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. What he's saying here is, okay, you're saying that there's some benefits to us having God's word. Okay, we get that. But the fact that the Jews who are under God's word still are unfaithful to God, doesn't that show that God is also not faithful? Because didn't he promise to Abraham that all his descendants will follow him? Yes, he did. But he also said that they need to abide by his words. So the fact that they, they are not abiding is not God's fault. God is still faithful. And by the way, in the big scheme of things, he does fulfill his promises, but maybe not using those specific people at that specific time. So God's Faithfulness is shown by the fact that he continues to stick by his plan. Jesus did come, after all, from Judah, a descendant of Judah, a descendant of David. And God made sure, even when people were unfaithful, that God preserves their nation so that the Messiah can come. God is always faithful. Objection number three, verses five to eight. Are we doing then God a favor by sinning then? Because if you're saying that God shows his faithfulness even when we are unfaithful, then probably we should continue to be unfaithful so God can show his faithfulness. The short answer is obviously no. And there's two scenarios that he puts here. The first scenario is verse 5 and 6. He says, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak here from a human argument. By no means. For then how could ju God judge the world? No, you should not say that your unrighteousness or justifies to continue to do unrighteousness because God shows his mercy through that. And then he goes on to say, what if I lie? If through my lie god's truth abounds to his glory why am i still being condemned as a sinner and why not do evil that god that good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just by the way this is something that he will address later on in chapter six should we continue to sin so that grace may multiply absolutely not 
The notion that unrighteous conduct could ever serve a good purpose of enhancing God's righteous character is strictly a human argument. We should never excuse our sin so that we can see what good can come out of it. We must remember that God hates evil and we must hate it too. We must not put the Lord to the test. You are never going to do God a favor by sinning. And by the way, this is where messed up thinking can go this direction. Where I heard people who are trying to excuse God's sovereignty in all things through their sinning and saying, you know, if God didn't want me to go to this mistress that I have, I pray that I would get in a car accident. I actually heard the conversation with a guy like this. And guess what, Andre? I did not get into any car accident. On top of that, I feel so much more peace with this woman than with my wife. And I said, you are messed up, man. That's never, never how God operates. God tells you what you need to be doing to pursue holiness. He doesn't want you to put him to test. That's not how it works. Can God redeem the most awful of situations in our sins? Yes. But that's His prerogative. Our duty and responsibility is to pursue holiness and do the right thing without wondering, huh, oh, I wonder if I sin here, how He's going to redeem it later on. That's not what we're called to do. And he goes actually into our nature here in chapter, in, in chapter 3, verses 10 onward. He says, that's, that's a good way to go around it, but that's not a good excuse because your, your hearts, your nature is where the problem lies. You see, your nature, in your nature, you always want to do the wrong thing. And yes, God can use it for something great, but that's not a good excuse for you. Verses 9 onward, he gives some arguments for this. Why is it that our nature is problematic? Actually, he tells us what's the problem with us again. We already heard from him that he says, we are sinful, but he actually goes a little bit deeper. And these are, by the way, some of the hardest words in the Bible. And you might even say, why take so much time to talk about it? Because if we don't understand God's excuse me, if you don't understand our sinfulness and the, the gory and the darkness of our sin, we don't understand the glory of God's grace. We don't understand how merciful and gracious He is. That's why Paul continues his arguments because even though he already made the point already in chapter 2, he feels like you guys don't, maybe you don't get it if you ask these questions. You don't understand how lost you are. And in verse 9, he's pretty much concluding his argument from chapter 1, 18 until now. And he says in verse 9, in chapter 3, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin. We're under sin. We're unrighteous. And this phrase, by the way, under sin, it's actually very interesting. It's actually a judicial term. A judicial term, a legal term, as if you're under the citizenship of this kingdom of sin. When he says you're under sin, it's as if you'd be under the American government. You're a citizen of U.S. And so you have to abide by all the laws that are in that country. When you are under sin, under the umbrella of sin, that's your identity. You're legally bound to it and heart your heart your nature is bound to sin you're a prisoner to it that's another word to it you're a prisoner your nature is bound to sin there's no a way around it it's not like you're only infected by sin you're a prisoner to it that's important galatians chapter 3 verse 2 22 but the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in jesus christ might be given to those who believe we're prisoners of sin. So the human plight is not that people commit sins or even that they are in the habit of committing sin. The problem is that they are helpless prisoners of sin. They need a, another being 
God to come and save them and pay the penalty for their sin. Because they're prisoners for a reason. They're prisoners also because of their sinning. It's not just innocent people. That's important to recognize this. Because then what we need is a liberator, is a rescuer, a redeemer. Our human problem is not that we don't have good politics, even though we don't have good politics. Our human problem is not that we don't have enough knowledge and we need more universities and more education. We need more equality among people. Our human problem is sin. We are infected by sin. In theology, this is called totally depraved. But it can be a little misleading because some people say, I'm, I'm not totally bad, and you're right. So you should probably use the term radically depraved. The, the word radical comes from the Latin root radix, which means root. Your root is infected by sin. I, imagine... Jesus talks about the analogy of two trees. He says there is a thorn bush and there is an apple tree. What makes a thorn bush a thorn bush? It's nature. And as much as a thorn bush watches documentaries on how to become apple tree, uh, as much as they are told, this is how apples are developed, as much as you put fertilizer to a thorn bush, it's not going to change it from a thorn bush to an apple tree. Why not? Because its nature is different. And yes, you can be a small thorn bush or a big thorn bush. You can be a big sinner or a smaller sinner. At the end of the day, you're all sinners. It's very important for us to understand this. That we're all under sin. Someone actually used an illustration I thought is helpful to talk about the idea that we're all lost. It doesn't mean that every person is as sinful as every other person. It means that our legal condition is the same. We're all lost. And this is an illustration that I think it might be helpful. Imagine three people try to swim from Hawaii to Japan. One cannot swim at all. So he sinks as soon as he gets out of his depth. The next guy is a weak swimmer. So he flounders for 60 feet before drowning. The third one is a world champion. And he goes 40 miles. He starts getting a little bit tired. 50 miles. But after 60, he drowns too. Now, who's more drowned than the other one? The whole has drowned, no? And all of them are very far from Japan. Do you get the picture? They're people who probably in their religiosity, they're better than others. They're not as sinful as the others. But at the end of the day, they're so far off from what God requires of us. We're all under sin. We're all lost. And he gives here a, a string of quotations from the Old Testament to tell us how sin has impacted our lives. A strings of quotations. And there's at least seven ways in which sin has impacted our lives. Someone put it in that seven ways, but it can be less or more depending on how you want to look at them. But... Let me just point out some of the ways in which sin has impacted our lives. First, sin impacts our legal standing. Verse 10. None is righteous. No, not one. And we talked about the fact that even one sin makes you a sinner. Even one unrighteousness makes you an unrighteous person. So none of us have a righteous standing in front of God. Regardless of how good of a person you think you are, regardless of how much charity you give or do, regardless of how compassionate you are, in God's eyes, according to God's perfect standards, no one is righteous. Another thing that has been impacted by, by sin, our minds, verse 11, there's no one who understands. No one who understands. What does he mean by this? It means that our minds have been corrupted by sin. We don't understand God's truth. We have hard hearts that cause a lack of understanding and ignorance in regards to God. This is why, in, for example, in the, the world of apologetics, defending your faith, there are people who are rightly saying that unless God does the work 
of opening someone's mind. I don't care how logical you sound, how many PhDs you have to give the best arguments of God for someone who doesn't believe in God. Unless God makes a work of revelation of that person, you cannot convince that person of God's existence. And for that person to follow that God. That's an important reminder because you can work so hard and think this is it. I have the, this is the last argument or the, the ultimate argument. It's going to change everyone's mind. Good luck with that. It's a matter of heart. And only God can change that. Thirdly, second part of verse 11. No one seeks for God. No one seeks for God. Now this statement has been a source of a lot of controversy and confusion. How many times have you heard of somebody being told or said to another person, well, that person is not a Christian, but he's seeking. Have you heard this? Not only you heard it, probably you've been in churches that they adjust everything they do from programs to worship style to everything to, to make sure that they are appealing to the seekers. You've heard that. Now, how is that possible then here to say no one seeks after God. Is Paul wrong? Is he just using hyperbole? He's just exaggerating? I remember a few years ago, one of our elders sent me a link to a, uh, this um, show, the podcast, and, and some of these guys went to, the ones who were doing the podcast, they were, went to a, a Christian uh, publishing convention. So there are all the publishing companies in the Christian world. And these guys, they would go from booth to booth and say, hey, um, do you agree with the statement that no one seeks after God? And the majority of them said, actually, I don't. Because I know someone who seeks after God. Now, what that means is that Paul was wrong. And if you say, only oh, okay, Paul did not know very well, this is actually a quote, quote from the Old Testament. So not only Paul was wrong, but the Old Testament is wrong too. And it's not just one passage, there's several other passages that say, nobody seeks after God. So how can you put this two together? I think that Paul is 100% right. And we are wrong. But then, Andre, how can you say... That nobody seeks after God. Doesn't the Bible appeal to people to search after God? Why did Jesus say, seek first the kingdom of God? Or seek and you will find. Doesn't he say that? Yes, actually he did. But if you read Matthew 6 and Matthew 7, you'll see that primarily, actually not primarily, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to believers. But what about the text in Revelation 3.20 when he says, I stay the door and knock. And if you hear my voice I will and open the door, I'll come with you in, inside and dine with you. Again, context might be helpful there. Who's he talking there to? To a church. To a church. Why does it seem to us that people do search after God? And this is not a question that only we had. Or we have. This has been a question for centuries. Actually, a thousand years ago, a guy by the name of Thomas Aquinas, he was struggling with the same topic. And listen to what he said. Quote, When we see people searching for such things as truth, peace of mind, eternal life, or happiness, they're searching for relief from their guilt. These are things that Christians know only God can give them. So we leap to the conclusion that since they are searching diligently for those things which only God can give them, they must therefore be searching for God. But it is precisely this in which men's sinfulness consists, says Aquinas, that men seeks for the benefits of God while fleeing from the person of God. So what he's saying is that people are searching for the benefits that come from God because they're depressed, discouraged, and they realize... That the things of this world don't work. But they're actually not seeking for the God of the Bible. They're seeking for the benefits of God. Because think about the implications of someone who has a hard time finding God. Do we really believe in a God who plays hide and seek? A God who hides himself from those who would search after him? 
is it our task to find God or is it God who is searching after us? Actually, if you read the Bible from the Garden of Eden in Genesis to the conclusion of the book of Revelation, we have a God who is described as a God who is searching for and seeking to save that which is lost. God is pursuing us while we are fugitives fleeing from Him. Nobody seeks after God. And I know this with confidence because God says it so. Think about Paul and his testimony. You might think he's a religious person that seeks after God. He says he wasn't seeking after God. He was seeking the benefits from God. He was looking for feeling righteous. But when he sees Jesus and God changed his life, he says, man, I was not looking for that. I was the greatest of sinner. And his experience is similar to mine and many others out there i was not seeking after god yes i wanted the benefits of what it comes when you're right with god but i did not have a desire for god once you are a christian yes we're called to seek god's kingdom first and foremost seek to find christ more and more in our lives evangelists often as i said use this idea of God is at the door is knocking you've been seeking for him that, portray, that portrays a pretty weak image of God and I think it portrays this idea that, that God again he cannot be found he's playing hide and seek with us but it's not biblical Remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 4, excuse me, 6, verse 44 and 65. Nobody can come to me, this is Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Nobody can come. It's not will not come, shall might not come, maybe, cannot come. Why? Because they're dead. They're dead in their sins and trespasses. They're dead. Have you ever been to a, a funeral where they have an open casket? I see that in America it's not a, a very common thing, but in the world I grew up, it's, it's very common. If you go to a person who's dead, and you try to talk with a person, or you try to tell them things or you you're thinking that maybe if you put the feather on their face something is this knees or something I don't know I'm trying to be a, a trivial here but in a sense you're trying to do anything to to get a response from a dead person because the person is dead it's not going to respond so we have this imagery somehow that in in Christianity or in our world in our lives we were doing okay we were we were just not of, in need of God and God came alongside us and helped us we were actually maybe drowning this is another picture of, of people who are throwing this imagery probably very popular that you are drowning and someone sh uh, sends your life vest and you just have to pick it up but you're still alive that's the point that you're drowning but you're alive but the Bible never uses the type of imagery actually whenever it talks about people without God it talks about them being dead in their sins and trespasses and it's not a metaphor that is poorly chosen it's a metaphor that describes exactly how we are you are not just drowning we are drowned at the bottom of the ocean and there's we are lifeless God doesn't just have to send us a life jacket he has to come down and he has to dive down deep at the bottom of the ocean take us to the surface and breathe new life in us you need an overhaul. You don't just need a little bit of remodeling. That's so important for us to understand because, again, this actually impacts everything in our lives. When I finally understood this truth, I remember the, the sense of total gratitude and feeling totally inadequate because throughout the years I thought, you know, because probably God thought more of me because of my you know my good deeds as a young child I was pretty nice with my neighbors I had some older people around me and I would help them with their trash I would buy groceries for them every once in a while I'll do nice things you know and for sure God actually looked at me and said oh 
That's nice. Good job. Well done. I wasn't as bad to my parents as probably other kids were, all this stuff. And I looked at, uh, around and thought, okay, that's, that's good. That means God had mercy with me. But in my mind, I still keep a little bit of credit, you know. 98% did God, and I did a little bit too. Or maybe not 2%. As I grow older, I realize maybe 0.05. But nevertheless, for a few minutes in my life, I was bright enough to choose God. Thank you very much, Lord. What it says here is like, no, you were dead, Andre. The only reason why you are alive is because of God's grace and mercy. And why did he choose you and not someone else? We don't know. And we don't know if God doesn't choose it to someone else. That's not our business. What we know is that despite and in spite of our sinfulness, God chose to give us life. That should change the way we see our lives. Every morning we should thank the Lord for his mercy. We are not entitled to anything. Anything we're entitled to is death. And everything we got, get above that is God's mercy and grace. Think about how we're going to connect with our spouses if you're married. If, if, how we're going to connect with our friends, our family members, if we have that kind of attitude. There's more here, but I will leave it for next, next week to see the next ways in which sin has impacted our wills, our speech, our relationships. But I pray that as you think through this, you will remind yourself that it's not about how great you are, but how great God is, why he chose to have mercy with you. And by the way, that also should impact our evangelism. We're going to talk more about this next week. Because if God can bring to life you and me, he can bring to life anyone around us. He does it. It's the same with Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. How much did he contribute to him coming out of the grave? Nothing. I, I preached a few years ago in, from the passage of Ezekiel 37. The valley of the dead bones. And Jeremiah is brought to this valley and says, preach to these dead bones. And he says, what? Preach to the dead, dead bones? They're dead. And he says, just preach. Don't you worry about the results. You just do your duty. And all of a sudden, as he's preaching God's word, you see those bones bringing, coming to life. That's our role in evangelism. We persuade, we plead with people, but we're talking to dead people unless God brings life into their hearts. Isn't that the, the paradox of preaching? But at the same time, the beauty of God's word. He is the only one who can bring someone to life. That's why I always say, hey, if you meet with someone, read God's word. Bring God's word at the center. Don't rely on your smartness, on your intellectual abilities, because it's not going to help you. So with that in mind, I even want us to think about this table to remind ourselves that we, are so, we were so lost. We were so dead in our sins that God had to send his son to come and live and die for us. He could have given universes. He could have given all kinds of other things on our behalf, but our sin is so grievous in His sight that only a perfect divine being, God Himself, could have paid for our sins. And that's a reminder for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I pray that as we think about what you've done in our lives, that we are reminding ourselves of your kindness and mercy. That we don't deserve anything, that we are truly lost, that we are truly in sin, in darkness. I pray that as we think about that, that the glory of your grace will shine even more stronger. And instead of looking around and asking, why not that person or this person? Lord, we should ask the question, why us? Why me, Lord? Because I wasn't any different and any better than anyone else. Lord, thank you for that. And we do pray for everyone around us who don't know you. They don't know you yet, but Lord, we pray that they would 
know you one day. As you open our eyes, you can do the same with them. And Lord, if there are people here today or listening to this message, I pray that they would, who don't know you, I pray that they would consider your grace and mercy, that you're a forgiving God who says that you call us to a new life in you. And the only thing we have to do is to agree with the statements you make about our sin, to recognize that we're sinners and we need you and to come to you. And you will forgive us and give us new life. So Lord, I pray that you will do that. And as we celebrate this supper, this table, and many will see a picture of what Christ has done for us in this elements here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.